Jim, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I was trying to tell Jim that they should serve the food uh, while I'm, I'm talking because I know what's really important uh, uh, at this uh, prom night, uh, trade prom night. Uh, but uh, Jim, thank you very much for the very uh, kind introduction. And it's really great to be here among so many friends and a lot of familiar faces and especially a lot of companies that we all uh, very much uh, take for granted and so much value. And, and, and Jim, uh, we got to remember to, to plug uh, UPS, uh, ship your Viagra using UPS. Uh, <laughs> if you're a little bit sensitive about having it brought home or something like that or just giving it to a friend, just ship it by, by UPS. Uh, uh, anyway, I, I especially want to congratulate uh, Congressman Crowley and Congressman Brady uh, for receiving the uh, WITA's Distinguished Service Award, uh, which at the prom night is kind of like being named prom king. Uh, unfortunately, uh, neither one of you will be receiving a crown. You'll just have to settle for a, another plaque that you can hang in your office. Uh, but uh, your service on the House Caucus for Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation is vital. And I look forward to working with both of you. Uh, and why don't we have them stand up one more time to be acknowledged. Uh, Finally, I'd also like to acknowledge our U.S. Trade Representative, uh, Ron Kirk. He couldn't be with us uh, tonight, though I know members of his team are in attendance. And uh, uh, for the members of the team, uh, be sure to always challenge him to a game of golf. Remember that his, his handicap is 15, and you'll, you'll win. So uh, if he tries to change his handicap, don't let him do that. So, uh, but I'm glad to have Ron as a partner, uh, both in our effort to open up global markets, as well as to advocate on behalf of U.S. Uh, businesses. In its 25-year-plus history, WITA has established itself as the premier trade forum in America. And the work WITA does has never been more important than it is right now. Because the world economy is at a critical point. During previous economic crises, many governments, including that of the United States, have succumbed to the false comfort of protectionism. In 2009, it remains an open question whether countries around the world will go down that counterproductive path again. I want to make clear that America's trade policy will be characterized by openness and engagement with the world marketplace. You know the benefits of trade. More than most, both through your professional lives and through your work with WITA, you have seen that trade can create jobs and growth. Speed the delivery of transformative ideas and technology to improve lives all around our planet. And hasten democracy and the spread of freedom all around the globe. As the former governor of Washington, the most trade dependent state in America, I've been a longtime advocate for opening up markets around the world. Trade has always been crucial to American prosperity. And it has assumed an even greater significance in the current economic climate as other sources of growth, like consumer spending, have deteriorated. President Obama and we at the Commerce Department see real opportunity to grow U.S. exports across our entire economy, from large corporations to small and medium-sized firms. But as we expand our trade, we do our argument a disservice if we fail to acknowledge that the benefits of trade have not always been evenly distributed throughout our society. Just go to places with devastated auto or textile industries, places like Dayton, Ohio, Danville, Virginia, and you'll understand why. At the turn of this century, Gallup polled the American public on whether they thought foreign trade was an opportunity or a threat our economy. 56% said it was an opportunity. Last year, that figure dropped to just under 41%. The truth is that as long as trade is perceived negatively by growing numbers of Americans, it's going to harm our future growth prospects. We can't let that happen because trade is undoubtedly good for America. 
And that's why I've asked the Commerce Department to work in conjunction with other federal agencies to pursue initiatives aimed at helping those hurt by the changing economic landscape. And as we lend a hand to those adversely impacted by economic turmoil, we must also turn our eye for measures that can spur economic growth in the years ahead. President Obama recognizes that if we are to succeed in an increasingly competitive global economy, that America must fix our deep structural problems in areas like health care, energy, and education. The President has proposed ambitious reforms in these areas, and tonight he goes before the American people to explain the urgency of fixing health care now. I'm convinced that these measures, even if they entail short-term adjustments, will ultimately make United States businesses more competitive all around the world. And as the Obama administration takes these critical steps to strengthen our economic fundamentals, I've identified five priorities to improve our trade fundamentals. And these include, one, enhancing trade promotion and the support that we provide to U.S. exporters. Number two, pursuing visa reform. Number three, undertaking a review of export controls. Number four, strengthening international intellectual property protections. And number five, promoting more intergovernmental cooperation in support of U.S. exporters. The first element of this agenda is to make the Department of Commerce and Services more accessible to the innovators and entrepreneurs who need our help. Commerce Department has an array of tools to help businesses at every point in the cycle. From the birth of an idea, to standing up the company with that idea, to finding markets once that idea has been transformed into a product or service. But too many of these tools at the Department of Commerce are left on the shelf. As a consequence, many American businesses are missing out on viable opportunities, especially when it comes to accessing foreign markets. 97% of U.S. exporters are small and medium-sized businesses, but they only account for 30% of export value. And meanwhile, all of the American businesses that export, of all of those, 58% export to only one country. We can do better. There are enormous markets out there for U.S. companies. And Commerce has a trade promotion office staffed with some 1,500 people, including commercial service officers, stationed all over the world. And this is a potent asset for U.S. businesses, but with a greater untapped potential. Part of the problem is that so many businesses aren't even aware of the services that we offer. And even if they are, they don't have the time or the inclination to navigate a government bureaucracy. And that's why last month we announced the launching of a one-stop shop in Detroit, a one-stop business assistance center that will provide a single point of contact for the full spectrum of Commerce Department programs available to business owners. And we intend to actually expand it to include other federal agencies or, or uh, programs by the different agencies. And if this works in Detroit, and we're, we're very, very confident that it will, we will expand these centers to all across the U.S. As we seek to open up markets for American companies abroad, the United States must also acknowledge that it has room to improve when it comes to increasing the secure flow of goods, services, and people across our borders. In particular, the United States often makes it too difficult for foreign company executives to enter here to do business a shortcoming that has a real cost for American businesses by shutting out some of their best customers. For example, the Association of